Before we start this show, just a word from our sponsor. 20 by 20 Apparel. Founded in 2015, 20 by 20 Apparel brings original tributes to pro wrestling's classic arenas, moments, and events. They look to spotlight the bloopers, bleeps, and body slams along with the biggest, smallest, strangest, and strongest that pro wrestling has had to offer. Along with their awesome line of pro wrestling apparel, they do offer many services. In the world of wrestling, there are hundreds of shirts, promotions, flyers, social media accounts, and ads. Don't get lost in the sea of parody shirts and display fonts. They can provide professional graphic design services at a reasonable price. 20 by 20 also hand screen prints all the tees in-house. If you would like to discuss possible run of tees, posters, koozies, foam fingers, or whatever, drop them a line. Go to 20 by 20 apparel. That's the number 20 X, the number 20 apparel.com. Now let's get to the show. Fresh is the word. I'm Jim Duggan, got long wood for plenty hoes. I keep it fresher than fresh, but you already know. You suckers bummy, me, I'm money, I got a ton of flows. My weed loud like a motherfucking thunder roll. Your shit quiet like you ballin' on a budget though. We see your kicks and we laugh and yell the what it goes. You see me shining like a suit on puffy. You know my grind and shit is too strong, buddy. That's why the dude call money. I be stuntin' like it's nothing at all. Cause it's nothing to me, it's probably something to y'all. Trying to smoke like me, then come and fuck with your dog. Got a closet full of kicks, you can't cop it the mall. And I'm fresher than the freshest, you can tell it's in my essence. Bitch, you see the way I'm rapping? Yes, I do this shit to death. I tell I'm running out of breath. I tell somebody cut a check. But either way, you know it's fresh. But either way, you know it's fresh. Fresh. We fresh. 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 Fresh, God damn it, we fresh. Welcome to the Fresh of the Word podcast. I'm your host, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier. On Fresh of the Word, we like to deliver wisdom through great stories from the minds of bright creatives of pop culture. Through those stories, we like to dissect the journey of our guests and present actionable lessons and advice for our listeners, no matter what career or avenue of artistry they pursue. This is episode 109, and this episode's guest is one of the most wholesome guests I've ever had on Fresh of the Word. The award-winning children's author and illustrator, DJ Corson. As you remember, back on my episode with Dan Doherty, DJ was the suggestion at the end of the podcast. With projects like Half Cat, Do You Speak Fish, A Thousand No's, and the I Feel Children's Book series, among many other titles, DJ Corson creates children's books that bring a powerful message in simple terms that also connect with the adult reader. We talked about his latest projects and how he breaks down his day creatively, how he got into creating um, children's books, how to effectively write children's books, the mental and behavioral lessons, his plans for the future, how children's books differ now than when we were kids, collaborating with Dan Doherty, and what the 13th chair is. Okay, and before we get into the interview with DJ Corson, I definitely want to give a shout out to Knox Money, Bang Belushi, and Foul Mouth for the theme music for Fresh of the Word. And if you would like to support the podcast, you can always go to freshofthepodcast.com and share any links that you see on the website and any of your social media platforms. And if you want to subscribe to Fresh of the Word, we are everywhere. We are everywhere on all the streaming platforms. Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Stitcher Radio, Mixcloud, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, Breaker, CastBox, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Podbean, Radio Public, basically everywhere. Just go there and sign up for Fresh of the Word. And if you can, leave a rating and review definitely on Apple Podcasts. That definitely will help out the podcast. We're trying to grow it. We're always trying to grow it. Good things are going to happen in the future. I got a lot of ideas. So you want to be, you want to keep, want to be in touch. Want to be, get you, keep your ear to the streets, as the kids would say. Well, the kids back in my day. <laughs> At any time, if you want to hit me up, you can always email me questions or comments to djkfresh at gmail.com. And also, if you go on the Anchor app, you can send me a, uh, a voice message or any kind of message. It's like a voice message on there um, if you just search Fresh is the Word. 
And also, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kelly Omega Fresh, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash kfresh. And then you can follow Fresh is the Word at Twitter at FITW Podcast, on Instagram at Fresh is the Word Podcast, and at Facebook at facebook.com slash Fresh is the Podcast. All right, let's get into the interview with DJ Corchin. On a previous episode, Dan Doherty uh, suggested that I speak with you for a future episode of the podcast, and you guys have definitely worked together on many projects. Um, what are you working on these days? <laughs> um, well, that's, it, that's, a, that's a very big question. I'm, I'm working on a couple things. So, um, you know, because my day is so broken up into um, various aspects of my life, whether it's, you know, kids or, um, you know, uh, children's books or uh, a brand that I have that has to do around music education. Um, my, my day is often broken up into like five minute chunks. And so I like to kind of keep a bunch of um, uh, coals in the fire so that I can uh, pick them out as my, my brain kind of connects with them. So, um, you know, a couple of the things that I'm working on, um, I always have about five to seven outlines of kids' books that I'm always kind of cycling through um, and massaging and working through so that when uh, one of them just hits, you kind of like dive really, really deep into it. Um, so I have a couple of ones, uh, ones about uh, the use of technology in kids, which is, is huge right now. Um, so that's, that's a, lot, a lot of fun. Um, I'm in the pre-planning stages, stages of a really big Kickstarter for um, my I Feel children's book series, which is a series of uh, emotional awareness books, uh, all behavioral based. Um, they're, book of, they're books of, of about, they're nine books now, they're soon to be 10, but we're going to do a really cool Kickstarter with them uh, uh, coming hopefully early 2019. Um, then I have another uh, little uh, passion project that's a kid's book that Dan and, actually, Dan and I are, are collaborating on again. And he just finished the illustrations. He did just an amazing job as he always does. He kind of pushes his his own creative envelope and tries new ways of, of um, getting, you know, getting the reader's attention as well as, uh, you know, adding his own little personal flair to whatever projects he's working on. So um, those are the two biggest things I got, I got going on right now. Yeah. You're probably one of the, probably the most wholesome guests I've had on this podcast during my time. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely. You're, you know, an author and illustrator of many, you know, children's books. Like how did you, um, originally get into wanting to do children's books? Yeah, I mean, it's a long story, but the short version of it is um, I didn't know I wanted to do that until I started doing it. And what I mean by that is I went to school for music education. I was actually a high school band director for a little bit. Uh, when Before I was teaching, I was in a show called Blast, and it uh, – kind of like drum corps on a Broadway stage. It was a, re it was a really fun, high energy uh, show. Uh, I, a little fun tidbit is I, I was known as the unicycling trombonist. So I made a living for two and a half years riding a trombone and playing a unicycle. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> riding, riding a unicycle and playing a trombone. Uh, that's for <laughs> wholesome. And, uh, um, and then, uh, but what I found was I would also do these little educational seminars and connect with uh, students all over the country. Every, every city we went to on this tour, uh, we would do this little music education advocacy, kind of showing kids about the show, talking to them. And what I realized was there was a lot in common. So I started writing some really fun band poems, uh, just to be blunt, band poems. And they started being you really connecting with uh, kids from all walks of life. And that part was super appealing to me. And that's when I wrote my first book, which is how I met Dan Doherty. Uh, is and I, I heard him tell the story. We met on uh, Craigslist, ironically, for <laughs> job <laughs> posting, and um, and he responded, and lo and behold, we became you know good friends. And just it, that author illustrator relationship is just a fantastic story in itself, and it's one that him and I uh, are very proud of. But uh, once I wrote that first book, I found the impact of finding you know a common message and a common goal that reaches kids from all over the country and that inspired me to write uh, my first kids book my first like picture book and uh from then from then on I just kind of got addicted to it I really love the challenge of saying something meaningful uh and powerful in as simple and as less words and as least or as little words as possible 
Why do you feel like your books have been able to connect with so many kids from all walks of life? Uh, that's a good question. I think my, the things I focus on are, are to make sure that each book has one message that's very simple to understand, but could easily have multiple layers for discussion. So they appeal to the adults that are interacting with the kids as well, because the majority of kids' picture books aren't kids reading the books themselves. They're, they're either the kids reading them to the parents or the parents or guardians or adults reading them to the kids. And so when it has that, that mutual appeal to both of them, which I would, you know, if you were to interview most children's authors, that that's what it would be. They would, you know, they would say that you write the book for both the kids and, and the adults. Uh, but because I think I focus on one simple message and make it really clear, uh, it, it becomes something that's easy for both the kids and the parents to grasp onto and, and hopefully start a really good dialogue, whether it's about uh, communication or emotional awareness um, those can be very complicated issues. So uh, I talked to a lot of children's therapists, speech pathologists, um, people who work with kids on the autism spectrum. And, you know, a lot of it is, is really good stuff that's out there, but it's complex and it relies on the individual to kind of break it down. And sometimes it loses that potency. So I think that simple message is really what, um, what has been so attractive in, uh, in, in the success of some of these books. Yeah, you kind of just touched on, upon this, but uh, how do you sort of balance making it a good story, uh, being able to present it well, but also present factual information? Well, it's it's hard. So the only book that the only series of books that are really um, necessary to make sure that I'm on the right track because there's a lot of partnership with uh, um, a lot of professionals. Um, where uh, some of my traditional storybooks, uh, some of those are more common sense, right? Like be kind, those, those are always great messages. But the social emotional books, the I feel books, um, those I have to have a lot of conversations with. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of friends and colleagues that uh, um, ha are professionals in those matters. And so um, uh, I'll give you an example. So the 10th the book of the I Feel Children series that I'm working on right now uh, the books are, are kind of usually are kind of a little bit witty in some of the titles, but this one's literally called I Feel Something. And it's about uh, the concept of uh, what's called interoception. And it's the, it, they call it like one of the, uh, the eighth sense. And it's about being able to sense the things that are happening in your body. And I knew nothing about this until somebody that specializes it approached me at uh, a, an autism conference. And I uh, said, have I ever thought about it? And I, and I didn't. So I, I read her book and I started, you know, um, asking a lot of questions, doing a lot of research online. Uh, and I will tell you this, before I launch a book, I always have um, people critique it and give me feedback. I'm a big, huge fan of uh, critical feedback. Uh, I, I believe feedback is a gift. And um, if somebody's going to give it to me, I have uh, the responsibility to at least listen. I don't always agree, but I at least listen. And so, uh, you know, they'll, they'll tell me straight up, this doesn't work, this isn't right, this isn't correct, this feels weird. Um, and then w we work through those. I think the style, the, the ability to, um, you know, make it be fun, that's, that's the artistic creative aspect of it. And I'd like to think that that's, um, that's my job. That's, you know, how do I take that information and make it actually appealing? So it's a really good partnership and balance, uh, but you have to be open to professionals telling you, you know, hey, you're wrong. Speaking of things that you might have learned during the process, what are some other things that you've learned about mental health or just behavioral health that maybe you didn't know before and maybe, you know, most people don't even know about that you've been able to incorporate into your books? Well, I definitely learned that there is a need for uh, tools to discuss concepts like emotional awareness, behavioral awareness, um, I even just how to start discussions. One, one of the most rewarding moments that I've had so far with the children's book journey was uh, I was actually at a Comic-Con and I was uh, uh, selling my, my artwork and my books and I, I had the I Feel series out there and one of the books is called I Feel Different. And I had a, a mother 
uh, I was reading the book and she just randomly broke down in tears. Uh, it's, it's, I don't mean to laugh, but it's kind of a running uh, joke with me is that pretty much every show I have, there's somebody that kind of connects in an emotional way and they're in <laughs> tears in front of my booth. Um, and so, uh, uh, it, but it's always really impactful and inspiring when I hear their stories. And, but in this case, she just kind of bought the book and left. And then she, she got, she, she wrote me a really beautiful email saying, here's why I was crying. And, um, you know, her son was just diagnosed with Asperger's and uh, for some reason, the doctors didn't want her to tell him or, or there was something, something going on with, you know, they, I don't know if they wanted to delay it or they didn't think it was a good idea. I, I'm not quite sure why, but she said she used uh, the book to, to kind of go ahead and tell him what, you know, what was, what was going on and, and to be open and honest with it. And she said it gave her the words to, um, to be able to start that conversation because she didn't know how to start. And that was incredibly uh, impactful to me. And, you know, when I think about like my purpose and why I do it, that's definitely why, but it was also a moment of there's not a lot of great tools out there uh, to start conversations around things like mental health uh, and emotional uh, awareness. Uh, I'm very, very happy that it's, it's starting to come to the forefront in a lot of educational tools, you know, they have things called the zones of regulation and um, emotional awareness, emotional intelligence that they're really studying and really kind of trying to implement on a broader scale. Uh, but that was my biggest learn around mental health is that there's not a lot of discussion starters. So I'm hoping I can, you know, fill that niche a little bit. Is there anything that you, that maybe you haven't done yet through your books or whatever that you would like to do in the future that could be a part of, you know, those tools? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, when I work with in collaboration with, uh, different artists and, um, and their family, you know, they, every artist or every partner or writing partner or, um, illustrator that I work with kind of has, you know, a really great unique story and they always kind of bring things up. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that came up around, um, you know, what could we do with these books is um, get them into a, um, a curriculum design. So uh, having like uh, uh, some sort of uh, like a university or even PhD students um, analyze them and see what, you know, what can actually be implemented scientifically, um, you know, with data uh, around a curriculum. Um, so I think that's on the, that's on the horizon for uh in particular, the I Feel Children series, but um, I'll be honest with you, a lot of the children's picture books that we, uh, that in particular, the ones that Dan and I have done, have gotten a lot of attention around uh, what they, uh, the, the, the topics that they're trying to uh, communicate, right, working with others, um, how do you, one, uh, one of the books that um, we did, which is uh, one of our most popular ones, it's called A Thousand No's, and it's all about innovation and perseverance and, uh, you know, getting that feedback, like what do you do when uh, somebody says, I don't like that, or I don't think this works, you know, do you, do you get defensive? And um, how does that, how does that, how does that translate to a curriculum in say like an elementary school? So that's kind of what's next on the horizon. Being in the position that you are and what you do, when you sort of think, like look back to when you're a kid how do you feel like the, you know, the children's books were different from then till now? Um, there's a, there's a lot of difference. Uh, we are in a, a period of, uh, social, um, and, uh, you know, awaken, awakenness, if you will, like, you know, really, um, really starting to become aware of, our world is so diverse and beautiful and meaningful. And our, in my opinion, our children's books did not represent that at all. Um, and so I think the explosion of diversity that we're seeing in children's books right now is just a wonderful thing. My, my wife is a, um, a, a preschool teacher and she's a phenomenal teacher. And I remember her and I having a conversation about uh, not just uh, diversity of the actual child, but diversity in families as well. Um, all different sorts of families, in this world. And, you know, she said something really impactful to me, which makes sense, which is, you know, kids want to see families and people like themselves and be able to identify. And it seems like such a dumb moment, uh, you know, a, 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 an obvious, you know, thing, 
but I don't think it had been obvious in children's literature for so long. Uh, and if it had been, it hadn't been se- it hadn't been celebrated and brought to the forefront. But that that is absolutely a, a changing time in there. When you go back and read even some of your favorite authors uh, from childhood, uh, you know, you know, sometimes you read those books and they make you cringe a little bit based on where society is today, uh, and rightfully so. So uh, I'm excited to see that that change happen. How important is it? these days to have that sort of diversity in uh, children's books, whether it's in regards to the types of families or race relations or whatever it can be. How, why do you think it's so important to have diversity in children's books these days? Oh, I think it's essential. I, I will tell you that I think children's books have some of the best wisdom you could read um, better than any, you know, novel or any, uh, you know, nonfiction storybook um, just because they they're designed to allow you uh, allow the idea to be presented to an individual, but then like usually through some sort of metaphor. And in that metaphor, that individual is, uh, can then take it and make it their own and really kind of um, uh, work through what that looks like in context of their life. So, having diversity in there and you know, in whether it's through families or or race relations or um, sexuality or uh, uh, religion, you know, that allows the individuals a, if if it's somebody like them to be able to identify and connect. And then also on the other side of it is that, you know, my, my, my son is a, is a white male. You know, I think it's super important that he, that he sees, Lots and lots and lots of different types of peoples and, fa- and of people and families in all walks of life and all religions and, and, and everything is possible. Um, so, you know, th- that lesson is, is just as important for him as well. So uh, I would say, it, it, you know, it's, it's essential. I would say it has to happen. And if there's an author, an illustrator that's not doing that, you, you shouldn't be doing it. You, you really shouldn't be. You're, you're, you're messing up the responsibility that you have when you're trying to connect with uh, young kids. Yeah. See, when I was um, like, we were just talking about how, you know, back in the day, there's a lot of things where you, you look back now and you kind of cringe. When I was a little kid, um, I was super like conscious of pop culture, the MTV generation, the budding hip hop generation, sports. So, When I was a little kid, I was like in my school library trying to um, find all the books about, um, you know, black culture, black studies, big, you know, Mm -hmm. important black figures. And there just wasn't any in my uh, in my library at school. But the funny thing was there was one book there. Well, there's a few books. Of course, you always have the Martin Luther King books in there. (laughs) But um, Mm -hmm. there was a a book on Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And remember, remember back in the seventies, you'd have those books that are fifty pages long, bunch of pictures. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, really quick reads for uh, for kids. Um, and the funny thing is, I found this book recently because I've, it's always it's this book has always stayed in my mind for the past thirty years. Well, the thing was is like this book was like this. I'm reading this in the late eighties. This was a book that was made in the early seventies, and. There, there's a story in there, you know, going back to how, like, in these children books, they can, exp- you know, a lot of times they explain things better than any other book. There was this story about his, um, his coach, you know, uh, throwing a racial slur at him to try to motivate him. And in two pages, uh. into two simple pages, that author was able to exp- explain how it is to be a black man in America in that books very simply and very you know eloquently and it always stuck with me and i always thought that was my first like real lesson about what race relations were in uh in america so like yeah like i understand that when a a a children's book is written well that yeah it can it can really plant that seed in the uh in a child's mind yeah, you know, for sure, too. And, and that's, a, that's a phenomenal story about how something simple can be so impactful. You know, I'll tell you, too, like, as a, as a white male, 
children's author. Um, you know, I'm still looking for how I help advocate for, um, you know, for that equality and, and diversity, right? How, where does my voice fit? Um, how do I advocate for my daughter, right, as a, as, as a white man? And um, the one thing that I, you know, and I'm still figuring it out, but, but um, I definitely appreciate the journey. And as I'm, you know, writing books and working with illustrators or illustrating myself, you know, one of the things that I really try to be proactive on is to, you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the point of the book, right? So the diversity isn't necessarily the point of the book. And I'll give you an example. Um, Dan and I did a, um, a really great book called Thunderfeet. It's super simple. It's for really young kids. Uh, and it's about imagination. And basically what it is, is one of the, you know, one of the pages is this kid has made up a character for himself, you know, Thunderfeet or, um, uh, you know, whatever he wants to call himself. And then it's him in costume. And then on the other page, it's him in his, in the context of his life, uh, you know, in his, in his apartment or in his house or in her apartment or her house, um, what they're really dressed up, right? Like a pot on his head for a helmet and, uh, <laughs> and big shoes wearing, you know, blanket around as a cape, those types of things. And it, you know, we made a, we made it a point to show every, you know, as many different types of people and families in, uh, on those pages as possible. But the book wasn't a, itself about diversity, but it was showcasing, um, you know, children and family. That, that's really what it was. And there's more than just, you know, two parent white families in a house. Like that's not, that's not the majority of people in this world. And so, um, uh, so we, we took it upon ourselves to, to be very deliberate with that, but also not to make sure it's like, hey, check out this book. It's about diversity. It was really about imagination, which is universal to everyone. So um, that's one of the things that I, you know, I feel I can at least uh, contribute to in, in, you know, not to get too deep on children's books, because sometimes they're just worth it just to enjoy it as well. <laughs> um, but I think that we have a, a responsibility um, as writers and authors and illustrators if we're going to try to connect with um, young people to, uh, you know, enlighten and, and, and showcase, uh, the best of, of what we can be. Right. Yeah. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, um, Dan Doherty was the one who suggested you to be on this podcast and you've worked with him, uh, many times in many books, you know, how, is, how is it working with Dan? <laughs> uh, it, it's awesome. I mean, he's a, he's a great guy. You know, one of the things that I think, um, work really well with Dan and I is, uh, A, we both have really great, you know, similar work ethics, right? We, we want to do things right. We, we, we pay attention to, to doing things the right way. And we, and we think that's important. But the other thing is that, uh, we disagree with each other a lot, you know, creatively sometimes. And, uh, we have, you know, that mutual respect that is, you know, allows us to, uh, to brainstorm. Like we literally wrote the book called a thousand no's. But I do think that's a great metaphor for, his, his, you know, the relationship that him and I have. And, uh, you know, we talked through things. Uh, we just got in a disagreement about a cover the other day. And, you know, we work it out, and eventually it massages into, like, a, the best idea we could possibly come up with, which is, which is great. So, and I strongly recommend that when you find uh, people you want to work with, and, you know, whether it's, you're going to be a comic illustrator or you're going to be a pop culture artist or, you know, and, and you're going to work with others, you absolutely want to find people that you can disagree with in a professional manner and, you know, share the same goal of coming up with the best thing and be willing to, to look at different perspectives and try new things. And if it doesn't work, you don't have to do it. Um, but working with Dan has, uh, has been a great exercise in professional and personal relationships. You know, we, we do contracts, we, you know, we become really close friends, but, you know, we always say we, we have contracts because we're friends. And that's the most important thing is that we have that, that, that clear description of what's happening. Um, and, you know, there's no debate. We don't want to ruin our friendship over, you know, a, a contractual disagreement that if we didn't have it. So, um, you know, working with Dan and, and others like him uh, has been hugely influential in not only getting the product to be really, really good. He's obviously a super talented um, illustrator, uh, but many people don't know this about him. He, they're just starting to realize this, but he is a phenomenal storyteller. Like his 
uh, his books that he, where he does the writing on them are just phenomenal stories and really exciting to, uh, to listen to. So he, he, because he's such a, he's an amazing artist, he sometimes he doesn't get the credit that he deserves and is a storyteller, but he's a really great writer too. So. What do you guys sort of bring to the table when you guys are working on each other, uh, on, on stuff together? Cause you guys are both authors and illustrators. Yeah. I mean, I think generally when him and I work together on the, on a, on a logistics level, we fall into, we, we fall into our roles as writer and illustrator um, where, you know, I tend to, I'll take on the author role. I, we haven't done anything where uh, we've reversed that. Um, and so I guess, I think we play to our strengths for sure. But um, Dan, uh, Dan will take on the illustrator role and almost like a creative eye and, and really kind of uh, give, if I, you know, if I have this idea of what's in my head, um, you know, he's able to kind of take it and, and make it his own, but at the same time, really give me feedback as to if that's even the right direction or not. So he, he does take on a little bit of a creative direction um, uh, producer, if you will. And I take, I definitely take on the writing place and I'm also the, the publisher. So I own the, I own the publishing company. So, um, you know, I have to think through production and sometimes we design books um, based on how we're going to go ahead and produce it physically, whether, you know, how we're going to print it, what kind of paper, what kind of inks, all those types of things. So that can change the direction in which we creatively work as well. When um, earlier, like beginning of the podcast, you did say, you know, you, you kind of break down your uh, days into sort of five minute increments. You have like all sorts of things that you're involved in. How do you sort of keep all that together mentally and sort of, you know, take care of your mental health while doing all that? Yeah, um, they don't talk to you and teach you about that when you're young at school. I think they're starting to now. And, it, you know, it kind of goes to our other the other part of the conversation we we're having. But um, you know, one of the things that I've started doing for sure, not going to lie, I'm absolutely like trying meditation and taking five minutes or 10 minutes to, uh, kind of, you know, let my thoughts pass over me and, and get rid of any type of like anxiety of the day. Like if I feel like the day is going to be overwhelming or something stressful is happening, um, you know, meditation is a huge part of it, just kind of, uh, of my day on helping, you know, taking, taking five minutes out of your day to get two hours of amazing work done is, is, I mean, not only just makes great sense for your mental health, but it's good business as well. So, um, uh, that's one of the things, uh, that, that I do as well. I talk a lot about doing things for yourself as well. So I'm super into, you know what, like I want to go take a walk and, uh, go see this museum or I want to go, and uh, go to the local French bakery because I'm totally feeling that right now. And just taking those moments and um, out of the work day and, uh, and, and, you know, stopping to, to smell the roses, feel the wind blow. Um, those are things that, that I do. Um, and I think, and I know Dan touched on it too. You have to acknowledge that mental health is, is just as, if not more important than your physical health. Uh, and they're, they're, they're all connected. So, Sometimes just acknowledging that fact, uh, I would I would have people start there. And um, if people are struggling with anxiety or depression, uh, which is a common thing, and you you know the the, the data is out there, you can read a billion articles on it. That um, you know more often than not, if you're talking to somebody, they've you know they've struggled themselves at some point. Um, and we need to get that conversation more out in the open. It's great to see more celebrities talking about it. I think that's super important and acknowledging it and, um, and definitely fighting back. Uh, if you hear somebody being, you know, bullied or, or, um, uh, talked to in a, a different way because they're talking about their own mental health. Yeah. You were mentioning, uh, about how you and Dan working together and a lot of times your, um, your disagreements would come up to, uh, would result in a better idea. You know, how do you go about, whether it's with Dan or anybody else, uh, you know, dealing with disagreements? You know, what's your process of getting over those obstacles? Um, you know, I think we, the, the most important thing is to start with that agreement from the beginning, right? Hey, here's the culture of, you know, uh, uh, project work we're going to have, right? And if we don't have that discussion at the beginning and have that mutual agreement, it's probably not going to work. 
Um, for Dan and I, uh, you know, we're both passionate people about, about our ideas. Uh, but sometimes we just, you know, take a second and be like, let's come back to this later or we'll talk through it another time uh, for it. I, you know, I think we're very fortunate that we've been able to, uh, I, again, we, have, we just have the trust, the mutual trust and respect that uh, allows us to disagree. We really haven't had a creative um, difference that has been like, we can't do this project together. I think we, we both see it as part of the process. Um, and I strongly recommend that if you can't get to that place where you both see that as part of the process and know that you're both trying to do the same thing, you probably shouldn't start the project together. I noticed that you're a part of uh, this thing called the 13th chair. What's that about? <laughs> yeah. So the 13th chair. So I mentioned that I was a, I was a high school band director uh, and I was in the show. So the 13th chair is a brand. Um, it's it's uh, humorously inspiring anecdotes about band and music education. So the, the music education culture and the band world, if you will, uh, is, is really tight. Uh, really tight, really close with each other. It can be a small world, even though there's lots of people um, uh, engaged in it. But uh, the, 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 the brand really started out with uh, a series of books that Dan illustrated that I wrote uh, called the Bannards Book Series. Um, and it's all about taking what you do seriously, but not yourself too seriously. Uh, that's a huge anecdote that I really think uh, goes a long way. And I, you know, some of the best and celebrities that you've seen um, are people that do take what they do seriously, but um, don't take themselves too seriously. So the 13th chair is about bringing that to the band and music world. There's a lot of kids that suffer, uh, like you said, from depression and anxiety um, uh, in all, in all areas of life. But you know, I come from the band world, so this is my contribution of being able to um, bring together through humor and wit. Uh, as well as some inspirational stories from people all over the country um, to it. So there, these band nerds books are all, some of them are poetry, some of them are quotes, some of them are stories. I have a new one coming out, which are going to be uh, uh, like almost like band lore fairy tales um, that are all just kind of teach good lessons and can have kids that are in band and music education relate to. Uh, and, and Dan does an, an amazing job of diving into that world. It was the first book we did and Dan doesn't come from the band world. So uh, describing things like how you hold the trombone and how you ho uh, hold, um, you know, a clarinet or set a clarinet down. Uh, you know, there's little nuances to that world uh, that I had to introduce him to. So you got to <laughs> kick out of that for sure. Is there anything that you've been able to do in your career that you look back to when you were a kid and you wish that was there when you were a kid? Oh. Um, yeah, I, I wish, you know, we had access to more authors. Um, you know, I think that's true even today, though, as well. So I wish that I had more people come and speak to me, whether, you know, maybe it's not just authors, but professionals in general. And I'll give you, I'll give you a great story is, um, you know, I was working a retail job and I had the, uh, the honor to meet, uh, John Hughes. He came in and uh, you know, I recognize him and, uh, I, I, I never, I, I don't usually get like, um, uh, celebrity shocked and, um, and, and kind of lose composure there, but he was right. somebody that I just, I really admired. I loved his stories. And, you know, I was talking to him and, and the guy took a half hour of his day just sitting there, uh, at my work and we were just talking through some things. And one of the things he said to me, he goes, you know, well, what are you trying to do? Like outside of, of, of your work right now? And he goes, and I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to, trying to be a writer. And he looked me square in the eye and he goes, well, have you written anything? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, then you're a writer. And that moment totally changed my life because <laughs> I knew that I didn't need somebody else to validate who or what I am to be able to be who or what I am. And so, um, being able to be exposed to, you know, professionals that are writers or um, in that case, you know, back then too, maybe it was musicians um, to be able to give you those, those wonderful nuggets that just changes your perspective at the drop of a hat um, would have been really useful. Um, I, you know, when I was younger, I thought all, all authors were either really, really old or really, really dead. And, 
and you know, so if you know, you meet an author, sometimes it's still true. Like I, I come across somebody and they go, this is an author. And they're like, Oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> um, and you know, it, cause they, they, they think it's so far out of reach and technology has definitely helped with help that more people have been able to produce books because of, uh, uh, the self-publishing industry, which I think is phenomenal. And I'm looking forward to see where that ends up, um, over the next decade. But, uh, but I really would have loved more exposure to more professionals in um, as I was growing up. If there was something about your life and career, like a little bit of a nugget of information, a lesson that you could sort of extract from your life and career that someone else could take, it doesn't matter what they uh, do, uh, what sort of art or, you know, avenue of creativity that they're doing that they could sort of use in their life, what would that be? Hmm. Um, you, there's, you know, there's, I've had the, I've had the, um, the pleasure and honor and, and, and great gift of, of working with a lot of wonderful, uh, great mentors. Um, and, uh, in that, you know, in that journey, I, I've learned some really great things and it's hard to pick just one, one of them I just shared around, you know, don't take what you do or take what you do seriously, but not yourself too seriously. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say another, another one is that, is, you know, there's a difference between passion and belief. And for me, uh, passion is a, a, a fierce, fierce weapon to be able to make it a, a large impact in it. But belief for me is about applying uh, wisdom to the future, knowing that the inevitable is going to happen. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you have belief that you are going to be a New York Times bestselling author, if you have that and know that that's just inevitable, then the only thing you have to choose is, you know, the path on how to get there. And for me, that path um, and doing it right matters because there are definitely multiple ways to get there. Some, you know, some right and some not so right. And I think that choice is ultimately going to define the, you know, your legacy as a professional, especially as a creative, if you are going to be making things and offering that to the world. Is that too deep for a children's author? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's just fine. <laughs> yeah. I feel, I feel like I, if I'm the wholesome guy, I feel like I should swear or something. I just, I just for like street cred or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All good. And I always like to end yeah. my interviews with the, the same question. And that question is, who is somebody that's been a part of your life or career that I could realistically interview that would have some good stories or lessons to talk to on this podcast? Yeah, um, you, you know, just just so I know, is is it uh, just visual artists or can it be any type of creative artist? It can be any like anything in pop culture. I have like all sorts of different people okay. on this podcast. Cool. You know, honestly, I would absolutely nominate my brother. Um, my brother is, uh, you, you know, you sh he, he would give you some amazing perspective on pop culture for sure. So he's a he's a top forty uh, morning show host. Okay. Uh, in, uh, in, in Dallas and he's been in Chicago. And, um, so he's interviewed, you know, all, all the, the, the all the people that make up pop culture for sure. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, you know, he's, his, first of all, he's unbelievably hardworking. Uh, he started, uh, you know, basically the equivalent of the mail room, right. In the radio industry and worked his way up to, you know, um, to he's, he's, he's phenomenal at what he does, uh, to the, to a morning show host. Um, and you know, he has the ability to connect with, uh, the communities that he's in. And I think that's something that makes him unique in the pop culture world is that he strives to connect with the community that he's talking to, not just like, Hey, what's the latest thing that happened on the latest reality show? Um, so I think I would, you know, my brother, Scott is, uh, is, is a, is a great guy, I think to interview. Oh, awesome. Awesome. If anybody wants to go online to find out more information about, uh, what you've done or what you're up to, where can they go? Yeah, so the uh, the wholesome children's author is not above a plug. So uh, the uh, yeah, you can go right to my website uh, djcorchin dot com. Um, from there, there's links to the I Feel books, all my picture books uh, that I've done with Dan, as well as uh, some other author uh, other illustrators. Um, to link to the Thirteenth Chair website as well. I'm on Instagram uh, at 
DJ underscore right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, from there you can find links to all the other uh, crevices of, uh, of the internet that has me on there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. It's been great talking with you. A lot of great knowledge, a lot of great lessons. It was, uh, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for doing what you're doing and, you know, bringing light to uh, creators and pop culture artists. I appreciate it. So that was my interview with DJ Corchin. All the links to where you can find out what he's up to and purchase any of his books or whatnot will be in the show notes at freshesthepodcast.com for this episode. All right, let's get to the fresh of the word, fresh pick of the week. This episode's pick is the new comic from Sam Humphreys and one of my favorite artists, Jen Bartel, titled Blackbird. It's the story of Nina Rodriguez and her beliefs that this magical world ruled by ruthless cabals exists within the veneer of Los Angeles, but everybody thinks she's crazy. Like always, I love the artwork from Jen Bartel in this comic book, and there's a very wonderful cat that shows up at the end of episode, or not <laughs> episode, issue number one. So go ahead and pick up Blackbird. It's really cool. It's a really cool story. Um, there definitely will be a link in the show notes for this episode on freshesthepodcast.com for uh, where you can get more information and purchase uh, Blackbird. And you can probably find it at your local comic book store. All right, that's another interview. All right, that's another podcast in the books, another episode. Thank you for listening. Goodbye and good night. Fresh, 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 fresh is the word.